Hello and welcome to episode 28 of Sunaparanta's talk show, Listen In. This evening, we are delighted to have with us acclaimed journalist and author, Sonia Palero, who is joining us today all the way from London. Welcome, Sonia. It is a pleasure to have you with us. Sonia is known for her work that focuses on the marginalized, especially the lives of women. Her mission has been to bring to our attention stories about people that live outside the mainstream and to give a voice to subjects that tend to be ignored or forgotten. The Good Girls and Ordinary Killing is her latest work that has just hit the bookstores. It is based on the real life mysterious disappearance of two teenage girls from a village in North India. Today, Sonia will be in conversation with writer and journalist Prayag Akbar. Sonia Prayag, thank you for joining us and we are looking forward to today's discussion. To introduce our guest, Sonia Falero is the author of Beautiful Thing, Inside the Secret World of Bombay's Dance Bars, which was named Book of the Year by The Guardian, The Observer, The Sunday Times, amongst others. Her writing has received support from the Pulitzer Center and the Investigative Fund, and appears in publications like the New York Times, the Financial Times, and MIT Technology Review. Sonia is the founder of the literary mentorship program, South Asia Speaks, and the co-founder of DECA, a global cooperative of award-winning journalists. Prayag Akbar is a writer and journalist. He is associate editor at the Sunday Guardian. He is a former deputy editor of Scroll, and his first novel, Leila, was published in 2017. I now invite Prayag to begin the discussion. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, Sonia. Hello, Ishita and Leandra. Thank you very much for having us. And a warm hello to everyone who's joined us from wherever in the world you are. Uh, we're here this evening to discuss uh, a truly outstanding work of nonfiction. Uh, it's called The Good Girls. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, The Good Girls uh, by uh, Sonia Falero. Uh, it's out now from Penguin. And I'm actually so glad to have the opportunity, the, the opportunity to discuss this book. When Sonia asked, uh, I was really uh, excited because, uh, you know, what we have now, what 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 this book does is really, um, you know, this is, it's one of the finest pieces of reporting I've read in a long time. Uh, it really brings together, uh, brings out a narrative from, uh, brings out a narrative that even if something is very, you know, this case was prominent within the news, but we all knew very, you know, we all knew things about it, but to be able to go deeper to get actually what happened and bring even of the most prominent case to bring out some of the finer details to bring out to weave threads together and to be able to build this very very solid document uh, is you know it's a really impressive achievement. Um, as I was telling Sonia, it would have been lovely if we could have done this in Goa at the Suna Pranatha Center, uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know, COVID and all that. But uh, maybe for the next book. Um, the, just quickly, I, I did want to say that, you know, there, there are certain things, this is actually reads like a really gripping piece of long form journalism. It is, a, you know, it's a reported book and it's a long book. It's about 270 pages, I think, uh, but um, even longer, I think, but, uh, you know, it, it reads like a very gripping, thrilling piece of uh, reportage, like a long report. And, uh, you know, I think some of the things that it does are essential to long form journalism. You know, it creates, as I said, it, it, it takes a story that most of us are familiar with and it, it goes much deeper, but, and, you know, it helps us understand things that we all, a story that we thought we already knew. It creates a sense of uh, personalities. It creates a sense of the real lived lives behind these, you know, we might know names from the cases. We might know faces from the cases, but we don't understand what was at stake for these people, what was going on in their lives. And Sonia really brilliantly has been able to recreate those lives for us. Um, Long form journalism often, uh, you know, it helps us understand remote landscapes. Uh, and, you know, of course, uh, Katra, Badum, uh, these, are, these are remote landscapes geographically, but, uh, you know, these are also, I think what long form journalism does is, uh, you know, it can be about, it's remote, uh, you know, some, some, some places are remote culturally, some places are remote uh, intellectually or emotionally. And uh, what long form journalism does sometimes, and what Sonia's book does so well is, you know, bridge that gap. And allow us to see, you know, to sit amongst those lives, sit amongst those, uh, sit amongst these distant people, 
and understand what's going on. And finally, uh, you know, what she's done with this book is excavate a truth that, uh, you know, that many of the people involved, many of the people, um, many of the powers that we have, you know, would prefer to keep suppressed or like at least prefer went unacknowledged. So I just, congratulations, Sonia, on really producing a wonderful piece of, a wonderful work. And um, okay, on to the q and I'm done. Um, <clears throat> but so Sonia, would you, you know, I didn't want to give too much, I didn't know how much of the narrative you wanted, uh, you know, to be discussed at this stage, but so I thought, could you tell the audience a little bit about the book, about, you know, about what happens in the book, about the case? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, in, in 2014, um, Prayaga was living in London and uh, scrolling through Twitter, uh, same, as, same as many people. Um, and I saw an image of two children hanging from a tree. And uh, it was not even two years since the 2012 uh, Delhi bus rape. And without anybody saying anything, um, I immediately assumed uh, that the children had been killed. I, I had never heard of the village uh, where they lived, Katra Sadat Ganj. I had not been to Badayu, which is in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, but I knew that the worst, whatever worst case scenario I imagined was, was correct. And, and soon enough, you know, almost instantaneously, uh, the rumors started to circulate on Twitter that the children had been raped, uh, they had been killed, and then they had been hanged by dominant caste men. The children belonged to a, a Shakya family, and the dominant caste men allegedly were Yadavs who lived uh, in, in, in the nearby village. And I remember the response on, on Twitter, you know, the, the sense of loss and shock and outrage and helplessness in the sense that, oh my gosh, nothing changes, you know? Um, I did find it really interesting that, and, and, and disturbing obviously, that that picture was even being circulated. Mm. You know, I mean, they were, they're, they're children, uh, Padma, the, the, I don't, uh, I'm not allowed to use the real names as you know, under Indian law, I call the older, teenager Padma, who was 16, um, I, I call her Padma, and I call the younger one in the book, uh, Lali, Lali was 14. So the, the fact that, just the fact that this image was being circulated um, gave me also the sense that, you know, on the one hand, people were, were stunned with shock. And on the other hand, they felt it was important to circulate that picture because otherwise, people wouldn't respond. There wouldn't be an emotional connection because that's where we were in, in, in the history of, of our country with regard to gender violence. We need now to see a, an image of a crime in order to respond um, in, 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 any, in, any, you know, in, in any thoughtful manner. Um, and I suppose it was a thoughtful response in the sense that people on, on social media started to talk about, you know, how there were still no toilets, even just six hours outside Delhi, because apparently the girls had gone out to the fields and that's where they had been uh, captured. And, and there were conversations around education and caste and so forth, which are all very necessary. Of course, sorry to interrupt, but Modi had made that a big election promise, right? The, the bathrooms, I think that really kind of, uh, you know, the, that he was going to provide bathrooms all over India, in rural India. So I think it's just yeah. that. Swachh Bharat was very big. In fact, Modi had just been, had been sworn in uh, the previous day. And, uh, you know, in the, there were studies that showed that uh, the Bharatiya Janata Party for, for perhaps the first time had made uh, women's safety a major part of their uh, election platform. And the reason they had done that apparently was because several countries, including the UK, were now uh, giving out uh, visitor warnings, saying that, you know, if you are a woman traveling in India, please be especially careful. Um, I had wanted to write a book about um, sexual violence in India. And I knew that I would, I, I was writing this book to try and just I didn't understand what was happening. You know, I had grown up in Delhi and always felt uh, under siege. 
And I think I was, I imagined that a book would help me to understand the, the, the way that I felt and the threats that I had faced. Um, and, and because the rumor was established as fact, uh, and that, you know, the, the words open and shut case were circulating, I thought, well, you know, uh, for a change, why don't I, I take on a case that has actually been solved? Because I had written about sexual violence before, but um, it had required an enormous no amount of effort on my part to even get close to finding out what had happened. The so the idea was, sorry? Santos, uh, the book about the Santos? Yes, yeah, yes, 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 absolutely. 13 men, uh, a Kindle single that I wrote. Um, so the, it, it took me a few months to get everything organized, but I was able to go to Katra uh, on the first, in, in, in time for the first death anniversary of mm -hmm. the children's deaths. And my plan was to stay for about a week and, you know, conduct uh, all, all the interviews that I needed and then to wrap that part of my book up and then actually start writing this book on rape and so forth. Um, you know, but it was really clear in, in Katra, after speaking to members of Padma and Lali's family, they live in a joint family, that there's something uh, amiss. You know, um, Katra Sadat Ganj is, um, is, is six hours uh, outside Delhi. It's um, an agricultural um, village. Uh, everything is focused around the fields uh, because everybody in the village works in the fields. Either they own land, a small piece of land, or they work on someone else's land. Um, and, you know, they're the predominantly uh, Shakyas. They have, um, families have lived there for generations. And it's a very close-knit, uh, quite convivial community. Mm. But there was definitely a sense that I got that, you know, there was things that were said, that were being said to me that, um, <clears throat> That were perhaps not correct and things that were being left unsaid and so at the end of the week i was not confident that i could write about this case um and you know i was faced with the choice of okay do i just drop it and and find an actually open and shut case um or do i just come back and try and figure out who these children were and what had happened to them because you know with the with any crime, uh, it, it's it, it's not about what happened at the time, you know. Um, events have a long history, so in order to understand what's what happened today, you need to go back weeks and months, and in in the case of Padma and Lali, years. Mm. And uh, so that was the challenge that I had before me, and I I decided to to take it up. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you did, uh, but you know, I, I suppose the curious thing is why this case of others, but you, you actually explained quite well, actually, because you know, you do so many stories as a journalist and you encounter so many interesting things that you want to write about. Um, <clears throat> but um, I did, you know, you, you mentioned caste at one point and uh, you were talking about the caste angle into the story and it is, it was a very interesting dynamic, wasn't it? Because the Yadav caste, which is the politically powerful sort of at the state level, were actually uh, locally not powerful at all. And that was not what we heard in Delhi. And, and it was so, one, uh, you know, it was very interesting how you brought that out. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Like what was their access to, uh, you know, how, how the caste dynamic even plays out, you know, with, in terms of registering cases in a police station? Um, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that we all heard was that the children had been kidnapped and then killed by a man, a thug, a gunda called Papu Yadav. And that Papu Yadav belonged to a thuggish family of Yadavs who treated the village like it was their playground. And, uh, you know, the words dominant, powerful, gunda, jungly, all of those words that vocabulary mm. it's a small vocabulary but it says so much and it 
the impact is, you know, it, it forces you to recoil and uh, you recoil to the point where you don't want to know anything further. Everything has been said in just with just that handful of words. And so I as well had an image of, um, I had a certain image in my head, but when I went to Katra, um, you know, I, I heard similar stories. So I heard, for example, that Papu's father, Vire Yadav, uh, was a killer, killer hevo. Vire, uh, according to the villagers uh, of Katra Sadat Ganj, had killed his brother. And, uh, you know, he, he was all powerful. And it really creates, uh, makes you think of, you know, who is this person? Is he striding around the village with a, with a rifle, with a sword? And, and the fact is that, you know, there, there, is, there is truth in the fact that some castes, while being low, are dominant. This is certainly the case. And it's absolutely true that the, at the time, uh, the Yadavs, while they did not constitute a very large part of the population, did hold considerable sway because, uh, you know, there was a Yadav, uh, a, 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 a dynast in power, Akhilesh Yadav, and he, in the tradition of, of, of politicians in India, had filled the ranks of his cabinet, of the bureaucracy, and of police stations with members of his own caste. In this, he was not unique because, you know, if you see the actions of Mayavati or uh, any of the Congress politicians prior to her, this is what this is who we are politically, right? Uh, but while we acknowledge that truth, we can also acknowledge that it is not true for everybody. That, you know, I mean, not everybody enjoys that level of, of power. And in fact, the family of Papu Yadav was one of those families that had has no power. They, like the Shakyas, are a poor farming family. In fact, they were, you know, forced off their land when their land was consumed by the Ganga. Uh, they were called Ganga Kateve. And they had built a small little house, uh, 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 a house that stood out because it was made of bricks and concrete mm -hmm. in, uh, in a hamlet where a lot of other people lived in bamboo shacks. But like everybody else in their farming community, they worked relentlessly you know i mean it was really a you know it was a game of catch me if you can uh trying to get interviews with with members of of their clan because they leave for their uh, field they don't even own land so they work on somebody else's uh watermelon patch somebody else's field they leave at the crack of dawn and they come back late at night so they work really hard they also have not had access to education. They also have not had access to a lot of these vaunted government schemes that we hear about. So in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, their, their financial situation, they are no different than the family of Padma and Lali. In fact, they were arguably worse because they did not own land, whereas the family of Padma and Lali did. Now you can make the argument that, you know, this is a a, a, a small thing in a village where every in, in a village and a hamlet where everyone is poor. And that's exactly the point. The point is that there was no great disparity between these two families. And Papu himself, you know, 19 year old boy, or uh, 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 what a uh, uh, young man, of course, not a boy, mm -hmm. um, a watermelon farmer. And just like everyone else in his family, and just like everybody else in the adjoining village of Katra, Sadat Ganj, is just trying to live his life and get by the best that he can, you know? So there was such a lot of disparity between the narrative that is presented and a narrative that is based on very cruel and destructive stereotypes um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the truth, you know? And, and again, this is a case of many things can be true at the same time. You know, but while except, but but you it, it's really important to to investigate and to or to seek nuance 
Right. You know, uh, you cannot simply say that because an individual belongs to so and so caste, they must surely be so and so stereotype. I mean, that is a, a you know, a cruel injustice, um, and it's not something that one can do as a reporter. And actually, that's what happens, right? From a lot of rural reporting, uh, you know, they, when they, by the by the time it makes it to Lucknow, even to get Delhi, the story is that it's you know, it's it's. It's firmed up in, in that light, you know. It's the cast angle, though. This this Yadavs have attacked these people, and that's the way it is. Uh, you know, it happens all over the northern belt. I think actually it happens all over India. I think even in the southern belt, uh, I spent a little bit of time in Andhra Pradesh, and you see caste violence always gets reported in the same sort of with the same, uh, yeah. I mean, lack of nuance in the broad brush uh, kind of uh, report. Um, yeah. So yeah. you know, uh, th that's actually what I wanted to ask you about because. Uh, you, you create this very visual portrait of rural India. You know, it's almost uh, like from the first chapter on, the, the imagery is powerful and it's, you know, it's, it's not sort of, uh, uh, you know, it's very evocative of Western UP, of, you know, the, that whole belt of India. Um, so, you know, were you, I, know, I guess it's a writer question, but, you know, were you, were you concerned about painting this picture in a certain way? How did you go about doing it? I mean, what were you thinking when you were trying to depict this world? Because you know you you you're, you're going. Uh, it must have been very difficult for you to even enter that world. And I mean, you sort of. I, I know you grew up in Delhi, but it's still you know there is a distance there, and there's a bridge that you have to. Uh, sorry, there's a gap that you have to bridge. Um, so you know how do, I'm I'm curious about how you managed to enter that space to build trust, you know, to find this kind of truths that you have found in this book. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have reported from Uttar Pradesh. Mm. I did a story for Harper's Magazine about this incredible dad who, uh, you know, who, whose kids were kidnapped and trafficked across the border and who receiving no support from the police uh, decided to track down the children himself. You know, a real sort of Indiana Jones um, adventurer. And- mm. Uh, what's this? They were taken to Nepal, the kids. They were taken to Nepal. So they were in Beraich, which is in a, a you know, completely the opposite part of uh, Uttar Pradesh, and then trafficked to Nepal, which was just um, a, a few hours uh, across the border. So I wasn't unfamiliar with Uttar Pradesh and about how, you know, there is a sense a lot of people have, and this is true of other places in India as well, that you're basically left to your own devices. You know, look after yourself, stay healthy, stay safe because if something goes wrong um there's not going to be anybody to to help you and in in katra and jati what i found really interesting was the close relationship between the villagers and their local politicians mm -hmm. the villagers had completely bypassed all the normal systems and whenever they needed assistance of any sort, you know, the assistance for which you might say call an ambulance or call a doctor or call a police officer, they would instead call their local politician whose phone number they had on literally on speed dial, you know. So, I mean, these were things that I either was already familiar with or I was able to pick up very quickly because um, I had had some experience. But I can't say that um, it was any different from reporting anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It wasn't different from reporting Beautiful Thing, which, uh, which I did while I was living in Bombay and which was, you know, a, a, a sort of a portrait of the, the dance bars. I think that uh, by repeatedly going to Katra, I was just able to, I was just able to become comfortable in that environment and I was able to understand it. And, uh, and I was, you know, because I, I don't feel any need to, to rush. Uh, I, I'm never, I, I never feel any pressure of time. I felt that I could just keep coming back uh, until uh, for as long as I needed to. Um, I, th I think that's, that's basically what it was. You you did mention also uh, the police, you know, about like kind of um, uh, you know how the police works in these places and whether people go to the police or don't go to the police, you know, whether they go above the police, uh, you know, 
uh, in a more direct route. Um, and I, you know, one of the things that your book also reads like, we, uh, I was talking with Ishita right before this, right before you came on, and we were talking about how it's kind of a thriller, and it reads mm -hmm. like a thriller, but it also kind of reads like a police procedure, you know, uh, it, 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 there's so much uh, uh, brilliant detail about, uh, you know, how police, how the police function in, in a society like India. And uh, and in rural India, and um, you know, it actually reminded me of Tana French. I don't know if you read the murder mystery. Uh, she writes into the woods. She writes is Irish. Yeah, yeah. It, I've read a few of her books, of course. They're good. They're great. And it really reminded me of that because there's so much in-depth knowledge about police procedures. And I'm like, how much research did you do when you were writing this book? I mean, I was thinking of her, but you know, your book also has that same kind of quality in terms of how they, um, how you, how you write about the police. But the difference, I think, between you know Western police and uh, you know the police or sort of the police in the UK and the police here is that uh, you know our police procedures are often horrifying. You know, it's like when I was reading about some of the stuff that happens in this book, uh, you know, um, like in I'm thinking specifically about Lala Ram, the character, uh, you know, the the coroner slash uh, sweeper, and uh, or even you know. Right at the end, there's an amna samna that kind of encounter that you know that they do between uh, Papu and Nazru, or where they like they make them face off against each other and sort of you know cajole a confession out of one or whatever it is, you know. And uh, I mean, especially like it really seemed to me that there's because there's so there's such a lack of uh, resources. Yeah, uh, I think that really comes through in your narrative. Is you know you can't expect people who are so strained in their you know their budgets and in their uh, education, I think, or whatever, uh, to then produce, you know, the kind of, you know, the kind of investigative work that's needed in a case like this. Yeah, yeah. So Katra Sadat Ganj has a police chokey. And at the time of the children's disappearance, there were five police officers. So you would think that, you know, a village of about a thousand families with five police officers, well, that's not too bad, you might think. But Katra was one of about 40 villages that these five officers had to patrol. And, you know, they didn't have transportation. So they would use their own motorbikes. And because uh, police officers aren't paid for fuel um, on personal motor motorbikes, they would be compensated given the amount uh, that, that they would be paid if they used a cycle. So you can imagine, you know, a, a police officer who's earning about, you know, something between 20 or 30,000 rupees a month uh, is, is going to think carefully before, before you know, constantly refueling his, his bike. Um, they didn't have a phone in the chalky at the time of, of the disappearance. So again, they're using mobile phones. Uh, you know, and, and it may seem that, well, it's just a call here, it's just a call there, but these are people who also live under, who, who live under financial constraints. And uh, one phone call or not, it, it matters to them. And uh, because they didn't have phones, and of course, there's no question of having a computer, they would use WhatsApp, and they would use WhatsApp to, to even convey confidential information, you know they didn't have a toilet and they didn't have a place to sleep, which you may say, well, you know, why do you need a place to sleep in the chalky? Well, the reason is because they were expected to sleep in the chalky, but they weren't provided with, with beds. So you don't have a bed and you don't have a toilet, but you're told, well, you have to stay here until, you know, uh, for the next three months or whenever you're, it, it's time for you to take your, your, your vacation. So one of the police officers stayed in the government nursery school, which was right opposite spent the night there. Another one spent the night in, in a clinic close by. And one of them would just sleep in the courtyard. And so what happens is that, you know, if you get the sense that your work is not valued, you as an individual don't, are, are not valued, uh, mm -hmm. then you also start to think, well, I guess it's because I, I am of no value. I can't do anything. So then if I'm not expected to do anything, then why should I do anything? And even if I want to, what do I do without any resources? So this is not to take away, you know, take away responsibility for them. They had a job. Their job is to serve and protect. There's no argument there. But we cannot expect people to do their job 
without, as you say, providing them with resources. So, you know, on the night that the children disappear, you have these chalky officers um, at, uh, at sleeping on their charpoys in, in, the, in the chalky, you know, and by this time they have developed a, a terrible reputation. They are men who sit around uh, drinking during the day. They absolutely do not respond to calls of, uh, of, of help. Um, in the village, the calls of help generally, uh, you know, involved, say, a, a straying goat or somebody trying to move the boundary markers of their plot. Um, so nothing that involved violence. Mm. But uh, even if it had, there was nothing they can do, you know. So that night they are asleep and the family goes to them for help. And it's a case of, you know, the family has very low expectations, the police, you know, having no resources, having no training. And also, to, in, in, in the case of some of the officers, not all, having no interest. Because, you know, that is also something that, that must be said. Uh, we, the police officers were painted as malicious people who wanted to go out of their way to prevent the family members from looking for the girls. But that is actually not the case. And that's not what I found while investigating most of the case. I found in fact an absence of malice. Mm. What it was is that nobody cared enough and everybody just thought, well, you know, I mean, like, should we really bother? I mean, they will just show up. You know, I really need a good night's sleep and variations on that, that heartbreaking theme. So it all feeds into each other, you know, I mean, uh, not investing in the police, the police not feeling valued, the police then failing to do the job, which they should not fail to do because they are still, you know, they're still getting a salary, and they're still wearing the uniform, but the whole system starts to sag. And when a, a, a challenge presents itself, the, the, the people involved can't rise to the occasion. They don't know how. And that's exactly what happened on the night the children disappeared. Um, I know it does, it does seem like kind of intractable, right? It's, I mean, it's coming to you from every angle on uh, the problem. Yeah. Um, I did. I, I think we have enough time for maybe one more question from me, and then we'll uh, we'll go to the audience questions. They already sent it. It's very efficient. It was uh, excellent, actually. I already had five questions before, but um, you know, because you mentioned cell phones, and that's really a big part of your book. At actually, you know, there's a. It, I didn't realize how much of the story, how much it's a kind of hinge in the book. It's kind of yeah. you know, hinges yeah. on the cell phone, and. Yeah. Uh, I did want to talk to you about your incredibly short chapters because I found that very powerful. And it actually helped me keep you in the story, you know, with all the different characters. I found it. Uh, but there's that one particular chapter, I hope I'm not giving away too much, but there's a one chapter which ends with, um, you know, with the phone call, the transcript of the phone call. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Padma and the boy, or is it Lali and the boy? Uh, but, uh, you know, the unknown boy. And I had goosebumps. I literally, and, you know, so you think, about how the cell phone, you know, kind of transformed social dynamics in, yeah. in, in a place like this. And I, I noted in your bibliography, you had Robin Jeffrey's book and Asad Aron's book, you know, about how it transformed India, about yeah. how this, how, did you see that? You know, I mean, it's a big part of your book, certainly. And I just wanted to know how, you, how your book fits in to their analysis, how, uh, you know, how you built upon it or, because, yeah. uh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, the, the most interesting thing was to see the ubiquity of cell phones, even in a place like Katra Sadatganj. Um, and the reason I would say even is, you know, it's, it's not surprising that cell phones have reached them because cell phones are very, very, very cheap, uh, even uh, for farming families. And uh, um, data was not cheap. At the time, data didn't become cheap until uh, you know the arrival of geo, which wouldn't happen for another two years. But uh, what I found really interesting was that women had cell phones, and women were using cell phones constantly, same as you would see, you know, walking down the street in Bombay or Delhi. But women didn't own cell phones. 
that distinction was very, very clear. So, you know, you could see boys walking up and down the alleyways of Katra with their headphones dripping from their ears, listening to music. There is one mobile phone shop called Keshav Communications. And Keshav is a, a, you know, a modern entrepreneur who was widely admired by the village kids. And he sold all the latest uh, you know, made in China cell phones. And his shop was full of kids who just came there to, to admire him and, and his phones. And they could buy phones, the boys could buy them, but the girls could only borrow them. And the girls could only use phones under supervision. They needed a reason to carry a phone. And Patma and Lali, uh, you know, they had a reason to carry a phone. They too did not own phones. Uh, but unlike their mothers who could not read and who could not use phones, although they spoke into them, Padma and Lali could read and write and they could make calls and they could send messages and they could enjoy the phone as, as, as teenagers anywhere. In, enjoy phones or, you know, with, with, with considerable limited capacity, but they did enjoy it and they did get pleasure from, from this incredibly modern device. I mean, their family, keep in mind, does not have a television, you know, um, they don't have books and magazines or any other form of entertainment. The entertainment for these, these two teenaged girls was hanging out together, gossiping while they went to, you know, graze the goats. And so the phone was something exciting. Uh, and their reason for having a phone with them was that uh, they needed to use the fields at night. And rural Uttar Pradesh uh, has two sorts of pests. One is the, 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 you know, the natural kind. So you would have, you know, uh, uh, Nilgai, for example, or you would have, uh, you know, something potentially far more dangerous, which is uh, cobras uh, in the field, ubiquitous um, in Katra. And then you have the other kind of pests who are the bandits who show up, uh, you know, to steal uh, grain, to, to steal motorbikes, and, and as some in the village say, to steal girls. So the children were given a phone or they had access to at least four phones for their safety, to use as a torch and to use if they needed to call for help. And uh, the story starts um, with a, a, a neighbor, a villager, seeing them using a phone and not liking it at all. Mm -hmm. Just thinking, you know, it's daylight. And here are these two girls who are soon to be of marriageable age and look at them talking into a phone. What are they doing? Now, the man who saw them, you know, didn't know their family. Uh, he didn't even know them. And yet he felt it was his business to ensure that somebody spoke to them and stopped this sort of what he considered to be wayward behavior. And ultimately that phone, which is just such a source of entertainment and distraction for kids their age, became the source of their downfall. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, that really, uh, that's actually a great way to wrap up our little part of the conversation, but, uh, or my little part of the conversation, but thank you so much, uh, Sonia. It was uh, really wonderful to chat with you, to, you know, to understand a little bit more about the book. Uh, I love the book, can't recommend it enough. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, I will be recommending it often. Uh, yeah. we, have, uh, we have a few questions from the audience, okay. uh, which I'm going to try and get to quickly. Um, uh, so one, the first, is an interesting one. Why did you subtitle the book, An Ordinary Killing? What is mm -hmm. ordinary about a killing? It was, um, you know, it was not ordinary for me, certainly. And I, I, I don't know anybody who, uh, who would view it as such. Um, the statement actually came from uh, a journalist who um, had been working in Western Uttar Pradesh for many years and would receive calls all the time, you know, about uh, uh, a child who had fallen into a well, uh, a, a, a rape that had taken place, you know, a, a, a bachelor uncle who'd been murdered for his property. And uh, his, his, the stories that he reported 
were essentially a litany of rape, murder, rape, murder, rape, murder, to use his own words. And they had all fused together all these terrible, terrible inst incidents because they were so frequent. And when he heard about uh, the girls hanging in the tree and believed that they too had been raped and murdered, he felt um, even if he had wanted to pursue the case, his boss uh, would have told him, look, I mean, this is just another case of rape and murder. Um, it's an ordinary killing. So what are you going to go there for? And that is what makes the, the children's death so, so tragic, you know, because they almost as soon as they died, they ceased to be Padma and Lali. They just became another ordinary killing, another case of deadly violence that takes place in a state that is all too familiar with incidents like that. Um, I have a question here from uh, Rehan Chakrabarti, who uh, thanks you for making the time and all of that. And then he says, um, would, I'd like to ask Sonia how she succeeded in getting access to all the many characters and institutions in the book, uh, law enforcement and government agencies, uh, you know, what precautions you took while researching in Katra and around, which is, you know, obviously not easy or safe for uh, So in, in terms of precautions, you know, um, I was always uh, aware that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it wasn't perhaps the safest place uh, to report from, uh, you know, many places in India uh, and elsewhere uh, require you to be slightly more careful than you would in other circumstances. Uh, keeping that in mind, I can only take practical precautions, right? I could make sure that I had a trusted driver, that I had, um, you know, a good sized car because, you know, the, the incidence of uh, traffic accidents is uh, remarkably high in Uttar Pradesh. I could inform people of where I was going and when I plan to come back. So just these small little fixes but it wasn't something that I could keep in my mind all the time because then it would interfere with my work. Mm -hmm. You know, my work is the most important thing. And if I focus on the fear or, 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 or the danger and, and the statistics, which is by the way, easy enough to do because, you know, I would have breakfast in my hotel, uh, which was about um, two hours outside of Katra Sadar Kanj, and I'd get the morning paper, you know, the, the Badayu edition of the Times of India. I would actually take photographs because the, the headlines were so bizarre and so grisly, you know, that combination of, my gosh, how can this happen? Is this real? So, you know, if I read the paper every day and if I, uh, if I sort of thought about it, overthought it, then I think mm -hmm. it would have interrupted my work. You know, so there's that's as much as I engaged with it. And as for talking to people, I mean, I think that I think people appreciate and reward persistence. Um, and I also think that, you know, there's assumption that some kind of some people won't talk to you, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps because of how they've been portrayed in the media or perhaps because, um, you know, because of the job that they do. And I found that often that assumption is, is incorrect. And uh, a really good way to just find out if somebody will talk to you is to ask them. And uh, I'm often surprised by the answer, you know, and often, I mean, pleasantly surprised. So I think the combination of two things, simply just asking people and uh, making clear my deep interest in being objective and finding out what happened uh, was really useful to me. That's great. Actually, I think that answers a couple of, you've answered a couple of other people's questions also. Um, there's one here that I found quite interesting. It is, um, so what is your process? Uh, yeah, what is your process when writing? How do you sort through investigative material that is often contradictory and many times based on, you know, heresy or accusations? Uh, yeah. How do you deal with all that? Conflict? And in your book, it comes across so clearly because, you know, there's two polar, you know, two people, have, uh, two groups that have these very conflicting narratives and are trying to sort of, you know, bring that to your, bring that to you. There's yeah. A, you know. So in this case, there were three investigations to look at because, you know, when the, when the children were found, the police were in charge. 
you know so the the local the the state police took charge and they immediately well not immediately uh let's not give them too much credit but they did start investigating the case then uh, a special investigation team and sit came in and uh, they took over the case from the state police the sit didn't get very far because at that point you know the the, the family of padman lali had no interest in engaging with anybody who was connected with uh, the the state government and then finally uh, when the police investigation and the sit didn't get anywhere because not just the family by the way the villagers uh, refused to engage with them, then the CBI came in. So there are three investigations. And the upside of all of these investigations is that there were enormous name, uh, name lists uh, for me to go through. So I had witness lists, and that was just a gift. And some of those witness lists came with mobile phone numbers so I could call people, and some didn't. And they just came with, you know, the, the village, uh, village name. Um, but either way, I had a lot of people to talk to. And that allowed me to cross reference a lot of the information I had. And um, I think that was one thing that I was able to do, you know, uh, just constantly talk to people um, to narrow down facts. And in situations where, you know, I was confronted with falsehoods, which you know, if anybody's read the book, they will know happened not infrequently. Uh, this is a natural thing. It happens while you're reporting because, you know, it's a it's a sensitive subject. Uh, people want to protect themselves. They want to protect their families. They are concerned about how the village will treat them. Um, there are a lot of calculations that people make before and while they're talking to you. So one way around it is is, is to talk to people around them, you know, so, you know, not just to talk to the Shakya family, but to talk to Padma's cousin Manju, who, who lives in Noida, um, or to talk to Padma's uncles, who live in a village called Nabiganj, and then to build, um, you know, like this, almost like a spider web of, of, of family, of friends, of witnesses, and then put everything together. And that, that, that's what worked for me. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, you know, for the, the next edition, whenever Penguin does it, please put, uh, you know, family trees. It would, it would be so helpful because the, instead of the character list, because, you know, if I, it gets confusing, Sohan Lal, this one Lal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If, if you had them in family trees, I think like the old school, you know, Agatha Christie would start with. Uh, yeah. I mean, it would be helpful, I thought. Um, uh, okay, maybe we have time for another one. One more, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, <clears throat> oh, this is another interesting question again from Rehan. Uh, did you ever consider including photographs from the narrative in your no. book? Uh, so, such a good question. Such a good question. And I, um, I was asked this question by um, by my publisher in the UK. Uh, you know, um, it, when you write the story like this one of the challenges that you face is is uh, is convincing people that the people they're reading about are not all that different from them because they aren't you know i mean that is something that should be obvious but it needs to be said they aren't and and in fact several of the problems they faced in the investigation uh, are an example of how we actually have the same experience of life whether we, we like to believe it or not. And my concern was that by showing images of the, firstly, I couldn't show images of the children under any circumstances, but uh, even showing images of the family, I, I, I felt that you know, people would look at that and think, well, I can't relate to these people, you mm -hmm. know, uh, anything about them. And if you immediately assume difference then I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem for you because it's a problem for me as a, as a writer, because I need you to be in the story. And the way that I get you in the story is by showing you all the things you have, we have in common uh, and, and not showing you the, the differences. I mean, differences are obviously natural, but I did not want that to become, you know, the, the first thing that people encountered. 
That is, I mean, that's such a remarkable answer, Sonia. I don't, I mean, I didn't think, I, I didn't even think you, uh, that you would, you know, that that was the thinking behind it. I assume that maybe some legal problems or something like that, but that's really incredible because uh, that does come across all the way through the narrative, you know, because I think we focus so much on the human connections between father and daughter, between mother and daughter, grandmother and daughter, uh, uh, you know, those are things that are inst instantly identifiable to all of us. You know? um, and uh, it's, uh, I think, I, you know, it does bridge the gap, as you say. It, it does, it does, it does make the story so much more immediate. If I'd seen, you know, a, a photograph, maybe it would have been different. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I did. Uh, let's see. We have one more. Maybe. So. Uh, this, there's a question about all the various layers and themes in your book and, you know, the influences. The, the, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read the exact question. This book has so many layers and themes, influences and complexities. For you, uh, what are the main issues at play here? What do you think are the central sort of uh, aspects of the book, of this investigation? Um. I think it was the fact that you know that the children were very much loved as as children are adored by their their parents the children were uh, liked by the other villagers you know they had plenty of friends their teachers liked them um other padma's uncles adored her and they were they were valued you know but uh, it's not enough to value and love somebody. You also have to allow them to be human, you know, and, and a really vital part of being human is to be free and is to be able to think for yourself and is to be able to hope for yourself and dream for yourself and to be to pursue those hopes and dreams. And what the story tells us is that, you know, the, the most well-meaning parents could not protect their children uh, and, and they're not unique in that, you know, um, because simply of how they viewed the girl's place in the world and indeed their own place in the world. So, you know, of course, going further into the book, there are uh, so many shortcomings in, in, in terms of the police investigation, the, the, the flippant political response, the media steamrolling the family and so on and so forth. But I think it does start with the family, you know, the love was there. There is no doubt about that, but it's not enough. I think that really comes across in your book, uh, you know, it's a real strength of the book. Um, I think we should try and wrap it up now. Um, thank you so much, Sonia. Congratulations on this really, really wonderful book. Um, I'm sure that you're going to, you know, a lot of people in India must read it, and I'm sure they will. Um, and um, thanks, thanks for making the time. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you, Ishita, and everyone at Sonaparanta. This was really, really good fun. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia and uh, Prayag, for a gripping and compelling discussion. Uh, thank you for giving us your time, and we look forward to welcoming you in uh, to Goa. Thank you also to our audience for listening in. Um, the Good Girls is really a must read. Don't forget to grab your copy. The book is available on all online platforms and at your nearest bookstore. Thank you again and wishing everyone a good evening.